can we talk about this pandemic then? Sure. <laughs> For a bit. second. Yeah. Is a, so how do we, so there's obviously a huge amount of economic pain that people are feeling. There's a huge incentive and medical pain, uh, health, just all kind of psychological. There's a huge incentive to figure this out, to walk along the trajectory of reducible, of reducibility. Uh, there's a, there's a, a lot of disparate data. You know, people understand generally how viruses spread, but it's very complicated because there's a lot of uncertainty. It, there's a, uh, there could be a lot of variability, also like so many, obviously a nearly infinite number of variables that, uh, that represent human interaction. And so you have to figure out inter from the perspective of reducibility, figure out which variables uh, are really important in this kind of, uh, from an epidemiological perspective. So why aren't we, you kind of said that we're clearly failing. <laughs> well, I, I think it's a complicated thing. So, so, I mean, you know, when this pandemic started up, you know, I happened to be in, in the middle of a, being about to release this whole physics project thing. Yes. But I thought, you the know. The timing I, is just uh, cosmically absurd. A little, bit, little bit bizarre. But, but, yeah. um, but, you know, but I thought, you know, I, I should do the public service thing of, you know, trying to understand what I could about the pandemic. And, you know, we've been curating data about it and all that kind of thing. But, but you know, so I started looking at the data and started looking at modeling. And I decided it's just really hard. You need to know a lot of stuff that we don't know about human interactions. It's actually clear now that there's a lot of stuff we didn't know about viruses um, and about the way immunity works and so on. And um, it's, you know, I think what will come out in the end is there's a certain amount of, of what happens that way you just kind of have to trace each step and see what happens. There's a certain amount of stuff where there's going to be a big narrative about this happened because, you know, of T cell immunity. This happened because there's this whole giant sort of field of, of, of asymptomatic viral stuff out there. You know, there will be a narrative and that narrative, whenever there's a narrative, that's kind of a sign of reducibility. But when you just say, let's from first principles figure out what's going on, then you can potentially be stuck in this kind of uh, mess of irreducibility where you just have to simulate each step. And you can't do that unless you know details about, you know, human interaction networks and so on and so on and so on. The thing that has, has been very sort of frustrating to see is the mismatch between people's expectations about what science can deliver and what science can actually deliver, so to speak. Um, because people have this idea that, you know, it's science. So there must be a definite answer and we must be able to know that answer. And, you know, this is, it is both, uh, uh, you know, the, the, when you've, after you've played around with sort of little programs in the computational universe, you don't have that intuition anymore. You know, it's, it's, I always, I'm always fond of saying, you know, the, 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 the computational animals are always smarter than you are. That is, you know, you look at one of these things and it's like, it can't possibly do such and such a thing. Then you run it and it's like, wait a minute, it's doing that thing. How does that work? Okay, now I can go back and understand it. But that's the brave thing about science is that in the chaos of the irreducible universe, we nevertheless persist to find those pockets. That's kind of the whole point. That's like you say that the limits of science, but that, you know, Yes, it's highly limited, but th there's a hope there. And like, uh, there, there's so many questions I want to ask here. So one, you said narrative, which is really interesting. So obviously from uh, at every level of society, you look at Twitter, everybody's constructing narratives about the pandemic, about not just the pandemic, but all the cultural tension that we're going through. So there's narratives, but they're not necessarily connected to the underlying reality of these systems. So our human narratives, I don't even know if they're, I don't like those pockets of reducibility because we're, uh, it's like constructing things that are not actually representative of reality. Well, but and, and thereby not giving us like good solutions to how to pre predict the system. Look, it, it gets complicated because, you know, people want to say, explain the pandemic to me, explain what's going to happen. In the future. like predict. Yes, but, but also, can you explain it? Is there a story to tell? What already happened in the past? Yeah, or, or, general, or what's going to happen? But I mean, in, in, you know, it's similar to sort of ex explaining things in AI or in any computational system. It's like, like, you know, explain what happened. Well, it could just be 
this happened because of this detail and this detail and this detail and a million details. And there isn't a big story to tell. There's no kind of big arc of the story that says, oh, it's because, you know, there's a viral field that has these properties and people start showing symptoms. You know, when, when the seasons change, people will show symptoms and people don't even understand, you know, seasonal variation of flu, for example. It's, a, it's, a, um, uh, it's something where, where, you know, there, there could be a big story or it could be just a zillion little details that, that mount up. See, but okay, let's let's uh, pretend that this pandemic, like the coronavirus, resembles something like the one D rule thirty cellular automata. Okay, so I mean that's how epidemiologists model virus spread. Indeed, yes. They some sometimes gra- use cellular automata. Yes. Yeah. So it, and okay, so you could say it's simplistic, but okay, let's say it it, it is it's representative of actually what happens. Uh, you know. The, the dynamic of, you have a graph, it probably is closer to the hypergraph uh, model. It is, yes. It's, it's actually, <laughs> that's, that's another funny thing. Yeah. As, as we were getting ready to release this physics project, we realized that a bunch of things we'd worked out about, about foliations of causal graphs and things were directly relevant to thinking about contact tracing yeah, exactly. um, and interactions with, with cell phones and so on, which brilliant. is really weird. But like, um, it just feels like, uh, it feels like we should be able to get some beautiful core insight about the spread of this particular virus on the hypergraph of human civilization, right? Like, I tried. I didn't. I didn't manage to figure it out. But you're I mean, one I, person. Yeah, but I mean, I think actually it's it's a funny thing because it turns out the um, the main model, you know, this SIR model, I, I only realized recently was invented by the the grandfather of a good friend of mine from high school. So <laughs> that was just a you know, it's a weird thing, right? The question is, you know, okay, so you know. You know, on this graph of how humans are connected, you know something about what happens if this happens and that happens. That graph is made in complicated ways that depends on, on all sorts of issues that where we don't have the data about how human society works well enough to be able to make that graph. There's actually uh, uh, one of my kids did a study of sort of what happens on different kinds of graphs and how robust are the results. Okay, his basic answer is there are a few general results that you can get that are quite robust, like you know, a small number of big gatherings is worse than a large number of small gatherings, mm-hmm. okay? That's quite robust. But when you ask more detailed questions, it seemed like it just depends. It depends on details. In other words, it's kind of telling you, in that case, you know, the irreducibility matters, so to speak. It's not, there's not going to be this kind of one sort of master theorem that says, and therefore this is how things are going to work. Yeah, but there's a certain kind of, from a graph perspective, the certain kind of dynamic to human interaction. So like large groups and small groups, I think it matters who the groups are. For example, you could imagine large, depends how you define large, but you can imagine groups of 30 people as long, like, as, long as they are uh, cliques or whatever, like right. as, as long as the outgoing degree of that graph is small or something like that. Like you can imagine some beautiful underlying rule of right. human dynamic interaction where I can still be happy, where I can have a conversation with you and a bunch of other people that mean a lot to me in my life and then stay away from the bigger, I don't know, not going to a Miley Cyrus concert or something like that and and figuring out mathematically some nice See, this is an interesting thing. So, I mean, in you know, this is the question of what you're describing is kind of uh, the problem of um, the many situations where you would like to get away from computational irreducibility. A right. classic one in physics is thermodynamics. The you know the second law of thermodynamics, the law that says you know entropy tends to increase, things that you know start orderly tend to get more disordered, or which is also the thing that says given that you have a bunch of heat. It's hard, heat is, you know, the microscopic motion of molecules, it's hard to turn that heat into systematic mechanical work. It's hard to, you know, just take something being hot and turn that into, oh, the, the you know, the, all the atoms are going to line up in the bar of metal and the piece of metal is going to shoot in some direction. That's essentially the same problem as how do you go from this, this computationally irreducible mess of things happening and get something you want out of it. Right. It's kind of mining, you know, you're, you're kind of now, you know, actually, I've, I've understood in recent years that that the story of, of thermodynamics is actually precisely a story of computational irreducibility. But it is a um, it is it's already a, an analogy. You know, you can you can kind of see that is can you take the um, 
you know, what you're asking to do there is you're asking to go from the, um, uh, the kind of um, the mess of all these complicated human interactions and all this kind of computational processes going on. And you say, I want to achieve this particular thing out of it. I want to kind of extract from the heat of what's happening. I want to kind of extract this useful piece of sort of mechanical work that I find helpful. I mean, do you have a hope for the pandemic? So we'll talk about physics, but for the pandemic, can that be extracted? Do you think? Well, I What's think your intuition? I, look, the, the good news is the curves, basically, you know, for reasons we don't understand, the curves, you know, the, the, the clearly measurable mortality curves and so on for the Northern Hemisphere have gone down. Yeah, but the bad news is that it could be a lot worse for future viruses. And what this pandemic revealed is we're highly unprepared for the dis uh, discovery of the pockets of reducibility within a pandemic that's much more dangerous. Well, my, my guess is the specific risk of you know viral pandemics, you know th that the pure virology and you know immunology of the thing, this will cause that to advance to the point where this particular risk is probably considerably mitigated. But you know it's uh, you know does. Is is the structure of modern society robust to all kinds of risks? Well, the answer is clearly no. And, you know, it's it's surprising to me the extent to which people, uh, you know, as I say, it's, 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 a, it's kind of scary, actually, how much people believe in science. That is, people say, oh, you know, because the science says this, that, and the other, we'll do this and this and this, even though from a sort of common sense point of view, it's a little bit crazy. And, and the people are not prepared and it doesn't really work in, in society as it is for people to say, well, actually, we don't really know how the science works. People say, well, tell us what to do. Yeah, and, because uh, then, yeah, what's the alternative? The For the masses, it's difficult to sit. It's difficult to meditate on computational reducibility. It's difficult to yeah, sit. Yeah, right. to, it's no, difficult no, to, to enjoy a good dinner, dinner meal right. while <laughs> while knowing that you know nothing about the world. Well, I th think <laughs> this is a this is a place where you know this is this is what politicians you know and political leaders do for a living, so to speak. Is you got to make some decision about what to do, and it's um, tell some narrative that right. uh, while amidst the mystery and knowing not much about the the past or the future, still telling a narrative that somehow gives people hope that we know what the heck we're doing. 